Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with Charlie Robertson, the Chief Economist of Renaissance Capital. Again, Charlie, you get a chance to look at the whole world like we did last time round, so it's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me back. And thank you for making the time. Charlie, there's so much going on. So let's just start right at the top. You know, we've got these two, uh, this sort of t t titanic uh, struggle going on between the US and China. Uh, Trump, Xi Jinping, the tariff war. How do you see that uh, 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 affecting the global economy at the moment? I mean, has it, has it shaved off GDP? Has it now, is it now really hurting us? Is it going to hurt us more? I, I just see a lot of very negative data. Um, mm. Chinese PMI is one of the key leading indicators I look at, and they are keep on showing us some of the worst prints all of this year and late last year that we've seen in eight or nine years. Um, not as bad as 08, but, but very bad. Um, China's the biggest manufacturer and exporter in the world. You'd expect that to have a knock-on effect. It does. Uh, Korean exports haven't basically grown in a year. In fact, slightly negative. German exports are getting whacked. German IFO survey is telling us it's going to get worse. Um, we've seen this showing up in data Basically, global trade data everywhere, it looks like global manufacturing is in recession, or at least very close to it. And that's hurt emerging markets. And, and just staying with China, I mean, you know, I've been listening to a few other people, particularly out of the States, there's a guy called Kyle Bass, and they're very bearish and saying the Chinese data can't be trusted, it's worse than they're actually telling us it is, and it's teetering at the edge. Are you as, are, are you as apocalyptic as some of these people are seeing it? My long-term story uh, on China is that it's following very much a Chinese, uh, the Japanese model uh, that we saw, even to the point of having Olympics kind of in the 60s in Japan, a little bit similar to what, to what we saw in, in, in China. We've seen Japan move into a bigger role in special drawing rights in the 1980s when they were in the middle of a trade war with America. Uh, and, and China's got a bigger role in, in the IMF special drawing rights, uh, that kind of global currency as well at the midst of their trade war with America. Um, what eventually happened uh, in the trade war with America and Japan in the 1980s was that the yen got vastly stronger. That it got stronger. That was, it went from about 240 yen to 120. But no one's in, predicting a stronger renminbi. So Are you? What I'm saying is if that's what changed the trade deficit America had with Japan. Ah. All of the trade wars, all of the tariffs that Reagan imposed on Japan on an almost annual basis didn't make a difference. The trade deficit just got bigger. It was only after 1985 and the Plaza Accord when the G5, as it was then, rallied around and said, yep, we're going to support the American efforts to depreciate a very overvalued dollar. That changed the trade dynamics of Japan. Is the dollar overvalued now? No. No, it's 10% maybe. Uh, then it was vastly, on the, against the euro, mm -hmm. uh, we think rough long-term fair value is about 120, or at what, roughly 110. It had got to 0.6 mm -hmm. versus the euro in 1985. Staggeringly strong dollar. And the dollar then, then weakened, uh, and, and then Japan's currency strengthened dramatically as a result. And so did the euro. Um, and that did make a difference on the, the trade war. So to end the trade war really, to, to end the trade deficit, or at least reduce the trade deficit, the renminbi would need to go from six, seven to the dollar to three and a half. Is that feasible? No, probably not. <laughs> the Chinese are terrified of what then happened in yes. Japan in the late 80s. When the yen went that strong, interest rates had to be cut in Japan's very low levels. And the consequence was a massive property boom. And the Imperial Palace in Tokyo became as valuable as all of California. Did it? So we'd have to see, uh, you know, the, the, the comparison would be the forbidden, uh, the, the forbidden palace in Beijing becoming as valuable as all of California. Yeah. And at that point, you'd expect to blow up in China. And I, I do think that one way or another, we are likely to get to that sort of scenario. I, I do think it's really interesting because the majority of people that I look at are all seeing a weaker Chinese currency over time. If, if they don't resolve the trade war, if there's no happy accord, then I can see the Chinese compensating for these tariffs by further weakness. And that is, that's been the Chinese response over the last year. Um, and each time Trump 
ramps up the pressure. Um, that's the direction we keep on seeing from the Chinese, a little bit more weakness. And that's then feeding through into emerging market currency weakness as well. But if they are ever going to really resolve this, there needs to be some sort of compromise that would maybe have the Chinese going stronger to five mm. over a two or three year period. And I do think that would reduce interest rates in China. That could then lead to another property bubble. And I do think eventually China will have a big slump. Uh, but that would be very bullish for emerging markets if you got a strengthening Chinese currency to around five. Am I wrong? It, yeah, I think it would be great for emerging markets. Okay. It would support the whole commodity story. Chinese demand would be that much higher. Uh, they'd be buying all sorts of goods from everyone. And yeah, and people would be putting money to emerging markets because all of those currencies would be going a little bit stronger with it too. Um, that would be a positive scenario. I mean, in the background, we are hearing this, this idea that Trump wants to go back to some pre bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system, mm -hmm. where he wants everyone to agree for the dollar to devalue. And maybe 10% would be justified, but I think he's thinking much more than that. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, is that I don't think he's made any friends yes. globally. Uh, unlike 1985, the G5 were prepared to rally around America. So you're saying president. politically, his, 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 his whole political raison d'etre is, is not resonating? It's not helping him, no, Okay, we'll come back to those other, the feedback loop that China has, but let's just go around the world in the G7 Brexit. I mean, you know, it's been unputdownable, that Houses of Parliament. I can't, you know, I, I, I can't stop watching the thing. It's been years now. Do you, what do you see happen there? My base assumption, but I don't follow the UK. I think it's very difficult to follow your own country um, with any, and I don't, so I'm not at all objective here. Uh, will be that, that Johnson is going to bring back a, a soft Brexit deal at some point, and uh, his Brexiteer rebels or extremists, if you like, uh, are going to have to just accept that, and hopefully then the UK pan rallies back a little bit, and, and it's a less, the less destructive Brexit. It's not a doomsday scenario in your mind if the UK leaves the European Union, and you think they can carve out the sort of island economy and thrive out, outside Europe and closer to the US. I still think the political zeitgeist is moving despite Trump and despite mm. some of the populist kind of right-wing populism we're seeing. I still think there's a zeitgeist move also to be more environmentalist, mm. um, to be taxing the rich, to be taxing finance, to be to be shifting in that direction. So I'm not convinced that Britain will find a Singaporean style model. I do think UK investment will get hit. I suspect UK GDP will grow half a percent less a year than it would have done because there will be less long-term investment. If you want to invest in Europe and have access to that market, you've got 27 countries, different regimes, different languages that you can choose to invest in. I think Britain is hurting itself from the investment side. Europe. Yeah, and Europe's not the super exciting story. Europe is Japan with a 25-year lag, or at least Germany is. I was thinking back to, you know, the late 90s when I was at CSFB and this guy took a huge bet on zero interest rates. We've been there now for 20 years. And now Germany's there. Europe is there. Is it just a simple redux of what we saw? And is it going to be that lengthy or? I've been using a graph for about five or six years now. And it keeps on being very, very helpful. And it's German Bunds versus Jap Japanese bonds back in the 1990s, but it's German bonds since 07, mm. and, and Japan since the 1990 crash, which came after that Plaza report and the yen getting so much stronger. Um, it's been perfect, and yes, it's telling us we're going into a deflationary environment, and it's partly because the Germans and the Japanese save in the same way. Mm. They save in bonds and they save in cash. They quite like deflation. It works for a saver. If you're an American... Why does it work for a saver? Because you're getting a 0% yield on a, on, a, on a bond, but a deflation of, say, minus 2%. They're quite like the deflation aspect of this. You don't get taxed on deflation. That's an interesting point. But you do get taxed on, on inflation. If, you know, if there's a nominal return, the government can come in and tax your returns. Um, in the US and the UK, we have a tendency to be in equities. Um, pension funds will be much more geared towards equities than in Germany. And as a result, we tend to like a bit of inflation that tends to support equities. Um, we're not as expensive. And we own property. Mm -hmm. Germans, roughly half of Germans own their own house. Brits, it's much higher, 70 to 80 percent. And as a result, inflation is good for property prices. Again, it makes us feel a little bit better off. So we have central banks that deliver us a little bit of inflation. Uh, the Germans are always begging for an ECB, which will be reducing inflation to as low as possible.
So do you see the scenario we've got of negative interest rates and very low interest rates across Europe staying in play for now, another five, ten years? I mean, I saw a prediction of JP Morgan, 80 years, they're saying, of this. I think there's something very interesting going on, which might require a much, much longer term frame than we've ever looked mm -hmm. at, which is to go back to, I mean, throughout the medieval period, there was no inflation. Prices didn't move um, over hundreds of years, and uh, that was normal. Uh, then we had Bretton Woods and, and free inflated currencies, and we, we had this inflation burst for 30, 40 years, and maybe that's over. Uh, if it is over, what's interesting about it is how that kills inflation everywhere else eventually too. So 10, 15 years ago, we've seen inflation in Central Europe, emerging markets, Poland, Czech and Hungary go to basically zero. No one thought that would spread yeah. further, but it keeps on spreading further. And I wonder whether we'll see inflation fall even more. In Kenya, I was just asking the Central mm -hmm. Bank about this yesterday. Do they actually think, with quite a strong currency, that we're going to get very low inflation in Kenya for some years to come? And what did they say? They said the core inflation, ex-food, ex-fuel, mm -hmm. is running at about Two to three percent. It's mm. been for some time now. But the experience of people on the street is that that's not that's not where the inflation rate is. That the cost of living is actually quite expensive. There's always a big gap between mm. expectations and well, what people feel and, and, and what the numbers are saying. Let's let's now turn our uh, gaze towards emerging markets, which is your a core area of expertise. Um, you were making before we went to this interview. You were giving me a very bullish case, as bullish as a case you made some time ago to me about Egypt, and I'm giving you full credit for that. Really, Charlie, that was one of the best trades uh, that I can think of in the last 36 months, and you called it early, and it's still doing extremely well. But I want to go to a country you picked up on, Pakistan. You know, I've been watching Imran, uh, uh, you know, this great cricket player who's now come in as the Prime Minister. And generally, the, the, the mood music is that it's got tremendous issues with debt, IMF having to come in. He made lots of promises he's not able to fulfill right now. Why are you so bullish about Pakistan? It's, it's changed a, a lot. We, we were, were bullish back in 1415, um, and we wrote some reports about the good story that was happening. The market rallied very well until 2017 when it, when it joined the MSCI Emerging Market Index. Um, but already the signs of weakness were there. Uh, reform had stopped in 2016. Uh, the previous Prime Minister didn't want to push through structural reform. He bowed down to trade unions when it came to privatizing a steel firm and uh, Pakistan Air, in Airways. Um, reform had stopped. The currency was 25% overvalued. The IMF had left the country, apparently saying, if we ever come back, we're going to be quite hardcore mm. with you. Uh, then we had a corruption scandal. There was a lot going wrong uh, after 2017, and the market crumbled. The valuations had dropped to an extremely low level. You were telling me it's the cheapest currency on your market. Well, on equity valuations too, incredibly cheap. Price earnings ratio as well. Can't give you that figure off the top of my head. But it, it's cheap versus the others. It's it's one of the cheapest markets in emerging markets on, on equities. And the currency, which was 25% overvalued, has now dropped to about 10% undervalued. Mm. So it's long-term, 25-year average rate that we call fair value. We've never seen it that cheap, as you, as you said. Um, even in 1990-2000, when the IMF was recommending Pakistan default on its external debt, this was in the wake of the Asian crisis, um, Pakistan's currency didn't get this cheap. So you've got a, the cheapest currency you've ever been able to buy in Pakistan in 25 years. Uh, much cheaper than anything else in South Asia. Cheaper than India, cheaper than uh, Sri Lanka, cheaper than Turkey. Uh, not as cheap as Turkey. Not as cheap as Egypt, actually, in 2016. So when Egypt's currency got super cheap, it got 30% cheaper to its long-term fair value. And that's why I was so excited about it in 2016. But, and, and still in early 2017. But for Pakistan's standards, this is, this is very good value. Uh, they are good companies. There's good management of the banks and the companies. And investors have looked at this market before, and they're very underweight. No one owns anything in Pakistan. Is that in part because of the geopolitical risk, you know, this India, Kashmir issue? Yeah. It, it doesn't help. Um, but a big chunk of the problem is its tiny, tiny weight in the index. Yeah. Now, Pakistan was in frontier. 
I can't have the exact figure, maybe it's 10 to 15 percent of frontier index. So if you're a frontier fund, you're putting 10 to 15 percent of your money in there just to stay neutral. For an emerging market fund, you put 0.1 percent. Oh. And in fact, it's such a small 0.1 percent that if I added up all your working hours in the year, mm. how many hours should you allocate to China, mm. to India? You should allocate 47 minutes of your year to Pakistan. Is that all? So by the time I finish one meeting with yes. the fund manager, that's it, they've done their allocation. <laughs> they can't then go and look at stock time, you know, which stocks to buy. They, that would be allocating it far too much time for such a tiny market. But frontier funds and other more uh, off-benchmark funds can come in, and we think they probably will, because the currency is cheap, the equities are cheap. And in Rankar now is an IMF deal. The IMF has come back, they've, they've promised $6 billion, it's going to unlock maybe $30 billion more. It's, it's and is that sufficient to cover the shortfall? It should be, because the current account is, is collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a big deficit on the budget, big deficit on the current account. July figures alone, it was down 73% year on year. Um, so it, it really looks like the current account is getting dramatically better. And, so this, and, that, and the Saudis love them, yes. because the Pakistanis send the army over to oh, support no, the Saudis yes. in various ways. Gulf support's quite strong. The Chinese wanted to do well. The Chinese are supporting it big time, right? Indeed, they, they've been putting in tens of billions of dollars. That's um, the Guada project, the CPEC. That seems to be their escape hatch, right, in, via Pakistan. It, it avoids the Straits of Singapore. Mm -hmm. They can trade to the Indian Ocean with getting past India and, and any other potential <laughs> problems they might have. So they're keen for it to work. And actually, the Americans have come around to say, you know what, well, a more stable Pakistan is probably in our interests. And then I like the fact that it's, uh, electricity is sufficiently high to have a decent manufacturing base. Its minimum wage was $130 18 months ago. Uh, it's now 94. Bangladesh was $60 mm. 18 months ago. It's now 95. So it was twice as expensive as Bangladesh to employ someone in Pakistan. And now it's actually something cheaper. And education, because this is a big thing of yours. Educated workforce. This is why it's not another reason why it's not as good as Egypt. The currency is not as cheap as, as, as Egypt got, and the education numbers are not as good. Adult literacy is around 56%. I want to see 70%. And I get that across most of Africa now. But Pakistan's still 56 Parts of Pakistan are very successful, though. You go to Lahore, and you will have a higher literacy rate there, um, and also in the south and the coast, um, and, and similar to Bangladesh, in fact. And so you have. You have pockets of success in, in what is actually a very large population uh, as well. So those and those pockets are pretty big when you're talking about a couple of hundred people. Just talk about India. How do you see India at Still, the moment? Lowest GDP expansion now, five percent. Everyone's sort of saying that Modi miracle is not really working. Is it, in your view? It's India got over that adult literacy pressure to industrialise in 2015 mm -hmm. very recently. Um, they can see this happening, but the long-term graph we've got of India is compares it with developing Asia before it and sub-Saharan Africa ahead of it. This is what we think is coming in, in Africa too, which is you have 20 or 30 years of Hindu rate of growth, mm -hmm. as it was called, and then it takes off, and it started taking off in the 1980 period onwards, and it keeps on getting better, but of course there are dips, and all of the reasons behind those dips we don't focus on India as much as we focus on Africa and Eastern Europe. Um, but it could be the change in currency um, they did, uh, getting rid of the high value banknotes. Um, yes, uh, and I need to do some work on that issue. Um, but that, that, all of that movement would play in the role. Um, but yes, getting a dip to five, I would still be long term bullish. But, but equity investors have been taking, trimming their debts. It hasn't been, the sunset hasn't been. Looking elsewhere in Asia, what stands out? Indonesia has always been a long-term favorite of people. Is it for you, Malaysia, these sorts of countries? Indonesia and Philippines both came out very well. When we've looked at our electricity stuff and our education, they've both changed, either for education or electricity reasons, in the last 10, 15 years, and could be part of another big industrialization. Right. I think the best critique I had of that for Indonesia from a client recently was amidst all these China trade wars, you're seeing factories move to Vietnam. I, I but saw not that. so much to Indonesia. Why not? I mean, and well, that's, uh, again, it's another thing I need to do more work on. Yes, so you're seeing that as a possible. Uh, I think it should be doing much better now. Mm. Vietnam does come out extremely well. I was there a couple of years ago, I wrote a report. It, it, so much of it looks great. I totally 
understand. The only risk of Vietnam is that it gets caught up in the trade war. Mm. America's Trump, so this is the acting very unreasonably as yes. the worst abuser. He, 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 he doesn't seem to like anyone. <laughs> he likes he likes some Americans. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, so the Indonesia you think could be it a sort of be. Vietnam in the sense t it could take away the manuf some manufacturing out of China. Out of China. Yeah. And, and, and Philippines too. Okay. So 10, 15 years ago, Philippines didn't have the electricity. So it was more of an offshore service center. Sort of stuff that people talk about with regards to Kenya. But now it can actually industrialize because the electricity is there too. Um, so Philippines could do well, Indonesia could do well. Let's come now to Africa. Um, and of course, you're welcome in Nairobi. It's great to see you. Tell us, you know, I, I saw some very interesting uh, uh, article yesterday, which was talking about, you know, demography. And, you know, historically, every economist tells me oh, it's a demographic dividend. You know, the more people we have in Africa, the better. And I always worry, well, you've got to get them an education. You've got to get them work. Otherwise, what's going to happen? They're all in the cities. They're lying idle. You're just going to have revolution after revolution, wouldn't it? So, so tell us what, what's happening here, big picture, and what you like. I mean, on that first issue, you raised, do you have a demographic dividend across the continent? No, but the Sahel region just doesn't have the education. I mean, not even close to having it. The adult literacy rates they need. The sub Sahel region, you know, countries like Mali, uh, Somalia, yes. South Sudan, are going to give us negative headlines for. Uh, at least another decade to go. And this is because too many people are not being educated. They just, you need a 40% adult literacy rate to sustain growth. It's, it's, the, it's the work we've done um, and built on from this economist who wrote about in the 60s with Mary Jean Bowman. Um, so those countries, I just think, are really, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and I took this to the US Army actually about a year ago and said, these are the countries which are going to cause you well, a problem. This is probably that the, they're, you know, they're, uh, I don't know what they call it, they have a name for it. African Command. Uh, Africa, but, but they have a name for these sort of ungoverned spaces, and, you know, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult for a long time. And, uh, and I said, those countries in Afghanistan have yes. a problem. And then they said, so if we'd gone in and created that, if we got the higher adult literacy rate in Afghanistan 20 years ago, we would have fixed it. We would have fixed it by now. Yes. So it's a question of schools instead of military. Instead of bombing. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. But, so the demographic dividend isn't going to happen in, in, in the sub-Sahara region, uh, Sahara region. But it, it can happen if you've got a education, which you, a high enough literacy rate, which you do across most of the continent, and electricity. Mm. Which brings me then to this issue of fertility rates, yes. which I've been looking at. Because the question I've got is why is electricity uh, consumption not higher, and mm. part of the reason it's not higher in, in sub saharan is it's very expensive to build. Mm. China's got a lot because interest rates are 2 or 3%. Mm. Kenya's not got a lot because you've got double digit interest rates. Well, you've got more than the African countries. You do, you do, but I find this question of double digit interest rates, why are interest rates so high? Why do the banks charge us so much mm. for loans? That's right. I hear that in Zambia, I hear that in Nigeria, I hear that in Kenya. and. We put, found a piece when we were looking at China, um, and I was looking at when did China's banking system get big? Mm. Because there's a correlation, it seems, between big banking systems and low interest rates. If you've got a lot of money in your banking system, it tends to mean a big supply of cash and interest rates tend to be low. Um, and in countries with very small banking systems, your interest rates tend to be much, much higher. And that, that fits, this works and it's very strongly correlated with fertility rates. And what the Chinese found was that when you have five or six kids per woman, you've got no money for to save, for savings. And your kids are your savings anyway. You don't have to save in a pension because your kids become your pension. They're the ones who look after you. When your kids, when the number of kids you have drops below three, you've got a different priority function. Firstly, they are more valuable to you, each one of them. You want them to be educated. You need to save money to educate them and uh, ideally up to university level. And, and actually the share of, of bank deposits in the banking system doubled from about 30% of GDP when you have three to four kids per woman to 60% of GDP when you go to two to three kids per woman. So when I go to Bangladesh, which had a actually sterilization policy in the past, they have a fertility rate of two to three and a very high investment rate. Mm. India, same story. Uh, China, even more so. Very low interest rates, very high 
uh, investment rates, and that's propelling very strong growth. And when I come to Sub-Sahara, I don't find that. Mm. Um, with with uh, we, we, we now have it in North Africa, mm. in Morocco, Tunisia. Morocco well, interest rates are two or three percent. And where are the fertility rates there? The two to three in Morocco, mm. and, and their long-term interest rates are under four. Egypt. Egypt isn't there yet. So the countries which I find most interesting are the ones where we're going to see a change. Yes. It's the countries which forever have had the same story, mm. a high fertility rate, mm. and are about to shift. So into which this one are those? Those are the ones you're telling us we should be backing? These are the ones where I think you're going to see a big, big change mm. in, in size of the banking system, uh, the level of interest rates, and the level of investment. Kenya, mm. Ghana, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, you're predicting that fertility rates are going to come down. Fertility tonight. rates are very easy to draw out. We've, we've had the lines working for decades now. We can, we, can, we can forecast that by 2029, Kenya's number is going to be well under three. Oh. And that's telling me that savings are going to go up in the banking system significantly. And that's telling me that interest rates domestically, interest rates will come down. And Kenya will be less dependent on external debt. So if they're building external debt now, as says Kenya is, rising external debt, actually be able to balance that off and start using domestic debt much more in about five to 10 years. Um, and I think that helps in the investment boom. The 2030s is gonna be very, very exciting. Interesting. And I saw in that report, you actually pinpointed two countries where, you know, which are the, it's kind of darlings of people. Nigeria, everyone talks to me about this enormous opportunity, this huge market. And Angola, where you said you were pretty negative. You said, look, um, you weren't seeing that trend change in, in, in the fertility rate. Yes, it's, um, it was a surprise. I didn't realize the fertility rate was as high as it is, but it's around five. Mm. And, and what all the lines from everybody else in the world is telling us is it's not going to get below three for another 20, 25 years. And that implies to me that the banking system is going to stay strong. Mm. Banks will take money into deposits, but maybe just 20% of GDP, and they'll just lend to the government, which is what many banks do today. Yes, and, well, here especially. and that's what happens in Kenya today, but it's not going to happen in Kenya in 10 years' time. Mm. Is, is, so, so that's telling me that Nigeria then becomes much more dependent on external finance. Or the other solution is to run a current account surplus. Mm. If you run a current account surplus, you have a surplus of dollars instead, and that gives you extra cash in the system that allows you to have low interest rates. Which countries are doing that in Africa? Botswana? Botswana is probably, I haven't, um, I haven't focused yet on that. I haven't got, I can't give you an answer to that. Okay, okay. but you're saying that's one way of going about that it? That is one way of doing it. So what I think is important about that for Nigeria is that at the moment the current account might be dipping into deficit. Mm -hmm. Real interest rates are quite high, as all of this data is implying it should be. But they could change that by depreciating the currency which would give a one-off inflation shock, but would then give a surplus of good dollars in the system, and that would then... I would have thought they missed that opportunity, which CC took in a way. I mean, if I compare Nigeria to Egypt, and CC made those difficult decisions and reaped a dividend, in my view, from doing exactly that, whereas Nigeria went along with its two-tier currency system, the rationing, you know, that, the whole sort of paraphernalia that happens with that, and weren't able to do that. I, the Nigerians were, I think, arguing that a more gradual move, adjustment to falling oil prices was, was better than having a big, sharp shock. The advantage of that was that they didn't see the inflation spike uh, in 2015-16 that other countries like Russia or Kazakhstan, which did do the short, sharp shock, saw. But the disadvantage is that three or four years later, they still aren't growing very well. Mm -hmm. And Russia is. Yes. Russia's per capita growth. In fact, Kazakhstan's per capita GDP growth in the last three years has been the best of any oil exporter in developed emerging or frontier markets, followed by Russia. And you know, Nigeria's not done as well, nor is Anger. I'm going to come back to that for a minute. Just quickly touch on Russia, because it seemed to me, you know, it's quite interesting that Previous shocks seem to have shaken up Putin and his people. They took a much more conservative approach to running the economy. You can see they've stored up a whole load of gold. Is that correct? Is that a correct interpretation? Very, very much. They, they are, they are most conservative, normal, orthodox 
kind of economy, central bank that, that is probably in the world right now. That's right. I heard, I think it was you saying that on a Bloomberg interview, and, and the interviewer was stunned when you said that. But it asked you who's running the most conservative central bank. He said, actually, it's Russia. And it's, it's fascinating. And I think they're getting the dividends right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think interest rates are going to come down a little bit more in Russia than people would expect because inflation is well under control. Um, they are actually having uh, brought themselves a budget surplus, big budget savings tucked away, half a trillion dollar of reserves. Now Putin is saying it's time to spend a little of that. And we're going to try and get growth up a little uh, through some national projects, uh, improved telecommunications, digital network, better education and all of these good things. Um, and he wants to get growth up a little bit. But people all, always look at the growth numbers in Russia and forget the population is shrinking. Yes. Um, the working age population is shrinking. So uh, people look at a 2% number for Russia or 1%. And it's, it's terrible. But actually, the cap to turn is quite well. Yes, yeah, well. that's an interesting point. Um, so they've beaten Canada in the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, and they've beaten kind of other all the wrong way. Um, but, but it gets concealed because of the population, because no one had kids in the 90s. Yes. And as a result, the oh, kids now. More so, but there's a whole generation that were never born to now have kids. So the population numbers just are, they're not that exciting. Let's come back to Africa again. Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of uh, political uh, events happen. You know, Algeria, Sudan, uh, overthrow of Bashir, Zimbabwe, well, we don't know whether there's been any change. It seems to be more of the same. Do you factor that into your equations, this kind of what seems to me to be uh, continent-wide? Okay, it's never going to be linear, but we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, regimes which have been entrenched for a long time come under significant pressure, and we're getting political change. Is this positive for you, or how do you read it? There's, there's kind of two aspects of this change. There's, a, there's an oil exporter change, which we flagged in 2016. Um, we said that when the oil price crashed in 85 happened, about four or five years later, four or five years after governments just couldn't give away cash to their people like they used to be able to, you saw democratization pressures building. We saw it in Mexico, we saw it in Iran. This is around 1990. Mexico, you know, the first change of regime, I think it's 50, 60 years in the mid-90s. It was partly to do with the oil price having fallen. Russia, the Soviet Union, collapsed as a result of this, this pressure. Now, what this implied to me is that the oil price fall we saw in 14-15 yes. was going to lag four or five years, and in about 2018 to 2020, we were going to start seeing some interesting stuff happening. Uh, now, we've seen it in Algeria. Mm. Uh, We've seen it, well, with a lot of pressure on Venezuela. Yes. Uh, yeah, Iran yeah. is getting pressure. Now, admittedly, America's very much adding to that pressure. It's, 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 it's it's just, just touching on Iran, because it's, it had they, you know, this uh, level of sanction warfare that they've imposed on the country, I mean, what's happened to that economy? It's shrinking, but by how much? Looking back, I was asked about this by the Financial Times the other day, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if GDP was down 8 to 10%. Year on year. This last year, mm -hmm. uh, it's this is a very very bad hit for them. Um, so they've really got the back to the wall. You can understand why that they are now taking this very extreme. The currency, I mean, we talk about currency being thirty percent cheap to yes. their long term average. Is What's that? Extreme. Iran is is, is well, I've never seen anything like it. It looks like it might be seventy percent right. cheap. I mean, it's just it's it's madly cheap. I mean, it's, that's the unofficial rate, um, but. They, they do look in real trouble, which is why I think you've seen, presumably why you've seen attacks on the streets of the Muslims and some of these tankers, and potentially this drone attack in Saudi Arabia, and, and they, they've ratcheted it up to levels that they haven't done in when you When you haven't got an exit, where do you go? Yeah. So, okay, so you, you, you're... S We're seeing a, a sort of blowback from that fall of the oil price in 45 24. years back. Is that affecting places like Angola? Well, I think it may have contributed to, to why we see the shift. Mm. Um, and, and there, you know, maybe there is some change. And that currency is quite, that currency on the black market ratings has also got very cheap. Yes. Um, Putin's popularity ratings have actually dropped a lot. This is partly why he's now spending. Um, um, but it's even, it's even impacted Russia. So we're seeing demonstrations there too. So that's, that's an oil story mm. uh, affecting some uh, countries. There's a second bigger theme, and I don't know what to think of this yet, but the argument that if you get investment-led growth in Kenya, Tanzania, big projects, railways, and 
ports and the occasional kind of standard gauge railway, for example, or mm. power. Are you bullish on all of that? I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. But mm. people on the ground don't feel that. No. If you haven't got a job building the railway, or you're not taking the railway, yeah. what benefit do you get from something that does look good to an economist? Yes. But doesn't feel good to you on the no. ground. So, that investment-led growth story, I think, is 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 hard to take. And I, I what I was discussing with people recently is, is China. Mm. If you go back to China's massive growth, double-digit growth through the 80s and 90s, if, if you believe all the numbers, but they were very high. It was an investment-led growth model. And even by the year 2000, their per capita GDP was $1,200. That's when, not when? much in the year 2000. It was $1,200 versus 800 said, in sub-Saharan. Somebody said to me, when, when South Africa got their independence, per capita was like eight times higher right. in South Africa than it was in China. Right. So the investment-led growth model, which China did, mm. um, Vietnam to do it, which has been, doesn't lead to wealth for a very, very long time. Mm. And people on the ground don't feel the benefits. So you've got to have people who are willing to make that investment and wear the pain. Yes. And, and because of the light at the end of the tunnel. And governments that can afford to make that investment mm. where it does help if your interest rates are low and your fertility rates are below three. Mm. So China could afford it because the fertility rate was low. Bangladesh can afford it because the fertility rate is low. Same with Vietnam. Um, and the fertility rate's not that low here yet, but it, it should come. So, so that requires a degree of patience. And, and the risk, of course, is that I need to look at when countries might have lost patience and said, actually, I, I can't be bothered to wait. And, and yes. you get lots of them start to overthrow there or demand a big political shift. And I think Zambia, actually, to some extent, already had that in 2011. It had 10 years of investment-led growth. People on the ground didn't feel better off. And they elected left-wing presidents who've taken the country to the verge of default. Um, it, is, it, it is at the verge of default now, isn't it? it it's certainly been trading that way. Yeah. Uh, on, on the Euro well, where's the euro bond now? I mean, I remember seeing it. Last I checked, it was the price was in the 60 cents mm. kind of area, which, which implies that already a haircut's priced in. Yes. If, if you've got a default, you might lose 40%. It's, it's, it's kind of in the price. Um, so there is that issue of patience, and that I think is different. Because you go to Ethiopia, again, actually investment-led growth model. Yes, yes. Uh, well, how do you read Ethiopia? Because he's very dynamic. I, I find him, ex you know, I, I find him as exciting as I found Mandela. You know, he says the right things. He's, he's you know, changing the linguistics around leadership. But it, is that model working in your view? We talked about this last year. Yeah. I was saying, is he a Gorbachev who's bringing in the change yes. of linguistics, perestroika, and uh, glasnost, and so on, which I think is, is happening. But Ethiopia's problem is that they don't have a big banking system. Yes, the fertility rate is tiny. The fertility rate is quite high. It's, it's yeah. actually, they are going to be one of the success stories in the next 10 years as well. So it will change. But for now, they have been running out of money. And I think this is where the shift towards uh, bringing in foreign investors is coming from. Um, and we're still seeing how that's going to unfold. Are you bullish? I need to go back and have a, another set of meetings before I could have a strong feeling on that one. Zimbabwe. I mean, you know, we had Mugabe, she's passed away. Um, my wife is sitting over there, told me when she was a young girl in Malawi, going to Harare was like going to the first world. It was. It was, an, it was the first wave of industrialization. Yeah. When we looked at education data and electricity data across Very Africa today. Very clever people, today, yes, even now, right? But in 1980, the numbers were good enough to, to be, for Zimbabwe and South Africa and Mauritius, to be industrialized nations. And then I checked the manufacturing data, and they were. Manufacturing was more than 20% of GDP. They were the first industrialization wave in Africa. Mauritius took it, ran with it, and did fantastically well with yes. it. South Africa has all sorts of issues still to we address. We haven't touched on that yet. It's complicated. No. Zimbabwe shows that even with the inheritance you can have educationally or in terms of electricity, it's possible to still muck things up. Venezuela is another example, of course. And the second industrialization wave then is North Africa today. And I think the third is, is going to be an East African story. Um, you think that? I think that's what this Fertility rate data, the electricity expansion that we're seeing over the next decade, that's that's what this is leading to. And one which is geared much toward, towards Asia mm. and towards Europe or America. So the Indian Ocean economy. Type. I think that's, 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 that's going, going to be have a pull effect on it. Very much. Mm. But Zimbabwe, so mm. Zimbabwe, we did a piece on this a few years ago, and just said wages are far too high relative to peers 
South African man was getting cheap with the Zim egg, well, the dollar that they had wasn't, wages were not adjusting down. Then they increased wages massively ahead of the 2018 election. Uh, they just created even more distortion. Mm. And, and you've seen this crumbling now at the exchange rate to the point where, well, I mean, I was looking at it, it's, it's, it's worse than Argentina. It's catastrophic. Yeah. I've got, I think there was a, there's someone going around on social media saying that you should be paying your gardener the equivalent of $10 a month in, in Zimbabwe. It's just, just, no one can live on that. No. It's $22 a month, it's the lowest minimum wage we've seen. No, but I saw somebody saying it's more expensive for me to go to work and come back because of the transport costs than what I'm getting. So, I mean, what's the point? It's, it's, it's a fascinating disaster, you know, from an economist's point of view, a fascinating disaster. For a Zimbabwean point of view, just horrifying. What has to happen, what does happen as a result is you cannot afford imports. Your trade deficit disappears and becomes a trade surplus because the only way you're going to bring any money into this economy is selling tobacco abroad, selling gold abroad, and they'll do that, and that will bring in revenues, and that eventually stabilizes this currency. And at that point, hopefully, you can draw out a five-year horizon, but there's internal political battles in Zimbabwe too. You made this interesting point to me earlier about commodities, and you were using the example of the DR Congo, I think, in your graph, and you were saying, look, Ali Khan, it's not making a huge amount of difference because the population per capita at DR Congo, even if the price doubles of cobalt, it's, you know, five bucks per head, right? As a, just talk us through that a little well, bit. I've shown the graph before, and I've done it many years, it's now you know, been shown actually by the the Nigerian finance ministry uses a similar graph now to point out that they, they export in Nigeria nine barrels of oil per thousand people mm. every day. The Saudis do 200 per thousand, per thousand people, and, and some of the other Gulf countries are doing three, four, five hundred barrels per thousand people. Nine barrels doesn't go very far, um, and it does work out as about 30 cents per person per day. Dollar mm. 75 actually works out for Nigeria a week, which doesn't build you very many motorways. And, and we've done this for the first time then looking at mineral exports as well. Uh, because of, you get a Botswana, mm. which sells two, three, four thousand dollars worth of exports per person per year. Yes. I stack it up against Nigeria, where it's a few hundred. Nigeria's not as rich as Botswana, as we all know. Uh, Zambia does a bit better, it's about five hundred dollars per person. So that's why Zambia is richer than some other countries, actually. And mm. politics has messed it up. but. It's quite good, but DRC Congo is around $100 per person a year. So even if cobalt prices go up as much as people expect with the electric so. car, even if production doubles, it's just not going to make Congolese wealthy. And it never does, um, unless you're very lucky, like the Gulf, like Kuwait, mm -hmm. five people in a pot of oil, <laughs> uh, or Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, very, very, very small population countries, a lot of oil per person. Or Botswana on diamonds, but for the rest of Africa, minerals is not going to be the same. So what, what is it? Human capital? It's, it's absolutely it's human capital. It's when people are able to produce goods, textiles at first, and then move up the value added curve um, and, and sell those to the world economy. Or high value added services, and it, it's about education, electricity, and ideally a lot of investment that you get when interest rates come down. Now, your trade last year was Egypt. What's your trade of the year this year? Pakistan. I think Pakistan is, is the one which offers the best upside. And what are we doing in Pakistan? We're buying the rupee. We're buying the stock market. Not necessarily today, because every time <laughs> I've been excited by Pakistan, there's been some geopolitical clash. And, and you've got to think about a fund manager going to his risk officer and saying, yeah, I, I did buy Pakistan in September. I did know about the headlines about Kashmir and how bad it was going to be, and I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, why did you do that? You had money. <laughs> now you've lost money because it's kicked off and it's all got very, very difficult. So I think, I think we do need to see a little bit of calm mm -hmm. on that issue. Um, but this is, uh, you've got double digit yields on the local debt. There's a 30% withholding tax, but that might be cut. Um, you've got uh, the, the cheapest currency for 25 years, and, and you've got very cheap equities. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a decent trade. It's not going to be as good. It won't. I don't trust it as much as I trusted Egypt in late sixteen. But it's the biggest new trade that we identified. Now everyone loves South Africa. You know, easy to get in the rand. I was looking at some data that Paul Wallace has tweeted out saying the Japanese trade four billion dollars of rand a day. It's a crazy number. 
South Africa, is it attractive at university levels with the RAND or? It is cheap. I think the around 15 to the dollar is pricing in this, this intensification of the trade wars. But Trump's trying to give us a little bit of dovishness on that. If he calls them off, trade wars end. South Africa is the benchmark barometer currency for a year. I can see it rallying back to 13 to the dollar. That would lift a little bit on the export side, because uh, there are a you know, mix of exports and quantities and, and uh, manufactured goods. It, it would look a little better. For South African growth to pick up to 3 or 4 or 5 percent, though, it's been, it's been negative per capita growth for the last four years, five years, as has Nigeria. Yeah. And I think this is why people are so down on Africa at the moment, the two biggest economies, third of the African continent, are not doing great. Now, luckily, there is Egypt, third biggest economy, and it's, it's, doing, it's been growing well at 5 or 6 percent. And actually, a whole host of African economies are growing well. Um, if you look at all the IMF data, it, 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 there's some good stories here, but they're just not big markets. So South Africa, I think it's going to be a long slog. Zuma took 10 years to take it down to the levels he did, and we're only recognizing now just how bad yeah. the situation that he left the country in. Uh, and that takes quite a few years to turn it around. It's pretty violent. The violence is amazing. I mean, the top 50 most violent cities in the world, 46 are in the Americas. Yes. A lot of violence. You Central in America, yes. South America, but also the United States, and four cities in uh, South Africa. That's it. The rest of Africa's all right. The rest of Asia's good. Europe's all right. Let's finish off with your thoughts on Kenya. You have been here. I see you had a big presentation yesterday. Yes. The government's there. What's your takeaway for us? Growth's remarkably good. Yeah. I thought growth was going to get hit this year. I thought austerity from yeah. the government. I thought the drought, the potential drought. We didn't know there would be one, but there was a risk. And um, there was a third factor, so just uh, yeah. the mood is, you see, amongst people that I speak to is that they call me soft. That's the mood around the ground. I, I think it's this investment-led story has been, it doesn't carry over. Okay. People don't, don't feel good about an investment-led growth story. And then that investment-led growth did give us the 5 to 6% or so that we're seeing. Um, the drought wasn't too bad. The interest rate cap hasn't hurt too much. But I also think the government didn't cut spending like it promised it would. It should have done. That, that would be a missed trip. There. And the consequence of that is there was an interest maybe for the, they, in fact, they didn't push as hard as they could have done to get rid of the interest rate cap. Mm -hmm. um, they're now talking again about a supplementary budget, reducing the budget deficit, like they had promised it would happen a year ago. And, the year before, yeah. and they're going to need the private sector to come in then and do more. And that does then imply that, well, and we're seeing it in this big round of the interest rate cap, that the interest rate cap comes off so the banks can lend and do some private sector support for the economy where the government needs to do a little less. If the cap comes off. Doesn't it put a lot of pressure on the banks? Isn't there then going to be pressure, upwards pressure on the government of Kenya interest rate curve? And won't that then feed into the banks who are so overweight government of Kenya securities? If you, you know, that's where the <laughs> bank balance sheets are. Happened, right. um, the hit to the, to the banks on that side. I think the government, if they do succeed in cutting the budget deficit from 7.6% of GDP down to about 6 that shrinkage could help offset, could help offset the, some of the pain from the banks lending to the private sector instead of the government. But a third factor here is the global environment. And if US Treasuries stay at around one and a half to Euro bonds are yielding six, seven, that's not, that doesn't seem to help. It's a bit better, but it's not super exciting. I think global investors will start to look more at double digit yields on local debt around the world. Benefiting Pakistan, benefiting Turkey maybe, benefiting Egypt, benefiting Kenya. Charlie, always a pleasure talking to you, and thank you so much for making the time today. I really appreciate it. I could go on all evening, but I know you've got here, you've got to go there, you've got an interview, which is bad. Thank you very much for having me on.